topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Camping Show. CW gets with you here. It is Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. We have got a great show here for you this evening. Tonight's episode is Outdoor Gear, Part 1, uh, Tents and Tarps. We're going to do a three-part series here. This is the first of the three with our special guest, Cliff Jacobson. Cliff Jacobson is one of North America's most respected outdoors riders and wilderness paddlers. He's a retired environmental science teacher, an outdoor skills instructor, a canoeing and camping consultant, and the author of more than a dozen top-selling books and a popular video on canoeing and camping. Cliff is a distinguished Eagle Scout, a recipient of the American Canoe Association's prestigious Legends of Paddling Award, and a member of the ACA Hall of Fame. And with that, welcome back to the show, Cliff. Hey, man, it just seems like I'm becoming an old timer on here. <laughs> Good to you're, like Ed, you. you're like Ed McMahon. <laughs> you're, you're, I love it. <laughs> Actually, okay. you should be Carson and I should be Ed McMahon. Yeah. If that's the case. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, hey, by the way, real quick, we've got a lot to cover here, but uh, in only 50 minutes to do it. But I'm going to tell you, um, you, sir, took a, a very adventurous cruise out west uh to be to visit your daughter in uh, California and I might add uh, for those of you that don't know Cliff is a a car expert a sports car expert and <laughs> he's got, he's got a, a Lamborghini Countach no I'm joking <laughs> but he does have a very nice sports car is it a BMW though isn't there something like that in 1996 it's only 25 years old. <laughs> It's still better than a Beamer I got. <laughs> and he drove with the top down. You can tell from that uh, luscious tan that he's got there. He looks great. He looks fantastic. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah, I do that every year. I drive out there every year and go through little mountains. Um, and uh, I just I just love it. It's a great job. It's a great yeah. job. I, I, I think that's the coolest thing in the world. So, yeah, yeah kudos to you, sir. Well, Let's start off by uh, having you explain. Would you explain the main differences between uh, a three season, a three season tent, rather, and a four season tent? Just for those who don't well, know. Actually, you would actually the, the 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 correct way to put it would be there are what's called summer tents. First of all, okay. that's a one season tent. Those are ones that just have netting, okay, and then they have a fly that goes over the netting. The plus part is is you get Lots of ventilation. Okay, it's, it's really nice and cool. The minus part is if it gets really cold, you're going to be cold because you got air going in and out. So that's a summer tent. Yeah, just about everything else you buy would be called a three season tent, which would cover summer through fall. Now, when you get into winter, it's a different ball game. Uh, now you're looking at uh, you're looking at tents like uh, the North Face VE series. These are five, six hundred dollar tents. These Norwegian, Swedish tunnel tents. Now these things are designed to withstand winds of 50, 60 miles an hour. Even um, they will stand up in what a terrific blow, a terrific rain. The bad news is they ain't cool in summer. <laughs> everything is covered the fly goes right to the ground oftentimes you have to enter the tent from the, the, the entries are often from the side so if you got a 40 mile an hour wind blowing in this way you can still get in the tent i would say you know unless you're a total diehard winter camper you don't want one of those things right. okay um a three season if you're just going to buy one go with the three season you know, summer tents are fine, but, and I have a couple of summer tents, and they're a good time and all that. But, you know, if it gets cold, and it can, there's nothing you can do about air going through that netting. Yeah, gets chilly. Gets chilly in the, yeah. Um, 
when manufacturers suggest how many people can fit into their tent, how did they arrive at that number? They lie. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, it's it's a little game that that manufacturers play, and it goes like this. My tent is a four-person tent. Uh, no, it's not. Try three. My tent is a three-person tent. Uh, no, it's not. Try two. My tent is a two-person tent. Uh, no, it's not. Try one. My tent is a one-person tent. Yeah. You, if, if you are a, a midget or a troll, <laughs> you might fit in a one-person tent. Right. I would say to anybody, unless you are a midget or madly in love with yourself, don't get a one-person tent. Because you're looking at these things are maybe 30 inches wide. Right. Okay? You can barely roll over in them. And the height on them is maybe uh, two feet. You can yep. barely sit up in some of these things. So, you know, unless weight is everything, uh, bulk is everything, I would say always go up one. But from what the rating is, yeah. yeah I mean, if, you, if you buy a four-person tent, I'm not going to say you can't fit four. You can fit four kids in there. If you try to put four adults in there, there'll be a war. You know, and the way I see the, fo the uh, diagrams is like uh, there's a head here and then there's then there's a head here. I don't want to sleep next to somebody's stinky feet. I'll tell you that much right now, but that's just me. I, maybe everybody else is fine with that. <laughs> Cliff, tents with elaborate designs that include awnings, windows, screened-in porches are all prone to fail when subjected to uh, severe weather. I mean, what causes some tents to fail in those those conditions? That well, you know, with due respect, um, I'm not – convinced that America, most most American tents have gotten better over the years. They've gotten more cutesy. They've gotten more colorful. But better? Mm, I don't necessarily think so. They're putting things in tents now which I, you just might as well roll your eyes. They have electricity in, that, in tents. Now there's little wires going in there and lights that you can put a battery in. They have plastic windows. You know what? I have a convertible. It has a plastic window, and that window is 25 years old. And the only reason why it's lasted 25 years is I am so meticulous with it, and I use 303 protectant, which is like an armor all product, but I think mm -hmm. better, often. And I just care for it like a baby. But with the tent, you can't care for it like a baby. And the pl plastic windows are going to be the first things to fail. The second thing to fail is going to be these little tiny zippers that they're putting in now to save an ounce or two because we're in that little game we play. My tent's lighter than your tent. Okay. <laughs> when the annual yeah. issue of Bell Packer Magazine comes out, people are going to gravitate to the lightest possible tent. And the way to get a tent lighter, use smaller zippers. Crummiers, uh, thinner poles, uh, and the list goes on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I and you know, as far as the other kind of tents, I don't know what's next. Maybe the jacuzzi or the uh, three car garage attached to your tent. What what's next, right? <laughs> but you know, here's an, an interesting observation. This isn't a hundred percent true, but it's an interesting observation. If you buy a California made tent, you got to realize it's made by people in California. California. There's nothing wrong with that. I love California, but you know, it doesn't rain a lot in California. You don't basically have a lot of bugs in California. So if you're going to design a tent out there, unless you spent a great deal of time outdoors under all conditions, like in the northern states, Canada, Alaska, you will probably tend to minimize things that don't happen where you live. Right. In other words, if you want a rain tent, I'm not going to say there aren't good tents made in California for rain. There are. But you got to know what you're buying. you got to understand what the variables are so you can say, yeah, that's a good rain tent. But if you buy a tent made in upstate New York, for example, it's going to be a good rain tent because it rains a lot in New York. It's just right. like kind of how it is. You know? Yep, absolutely. So it's just something to consider when you start you know looking for tents or whatever well i've heard it never rains in southern california you've heard that too right 
<laughs> uh, hey, let me let me ask you this: What specific features def- actually define a, a properly designed tent? There are a number of them. Go ahead and tell us those. What features to define it? Well, it depends who you're talking to. If you're talking to me, the features that I consider important are: it's got to be rainproof, stormproof. Okay, mm-hmm. so rain can't get in. It's got to be windproof. Wind can't blow it down. But to me, an extremely important feature, which is almost never talked about, you hardly ever hear anybody talk about it, and that is not just ease of setup, but how fast it goes up. Now, let me give you an example. If you gravitate towards one of the European tents, the European tents have a little different philosophy than American tents. American tents come in two parts, basically. They have canopy with the poles, and then when that's up, they have a fly that goes over the top. Now, the thinking here is the reason why we do this is um, so that you can get ventilation between the fly and the interior tent. And I would say to you, no, I don't think that's the reason at all. I think the reason why they come in two parts like that is because it's cheaper to make that way. Simple. Now, if you go, if you if you look at a Norwegian or a Swedish tent or the German tents, one of the things you find immediately is everything's connected. Yes, they have a fly, and the fly is sort of separate, but not quite. Now, by then I mean the fly. When you set the tent up, the fly is attached to the tent as the tent goes up. You don't put the fly on separately. It's already attached. Now, you can usually remove the fly if you want to, but it's a bit of a pain. you got a bunch of unclipping and so forth to do in order to remove the fly. But here's the difference. You pull into camp, and it's raining bloody murder. you got to get your tent up. Your tent has a separate fly. Oh, okay. So So first you get the tent up. By the time you get the fly on, it's soaked. Now, you take a European tent with a built-in fly. It just goes right up, and the fly protects the tent as it goes up. Now, to me, this is a really important thing because I have been on many, many trips where I pull into camp, and it is raining bloody murder, and I get my tent up, and I'm dry, and the other people around me are already soaking wet. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I don't like about nearly all American tents. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that um, the actual speed of putting the tent up is really important. In other words, you don't want to spend more, I would say, by yourself. If it takes, here's the bag. I give you the bag. You open the bag. I'm going to start timing now. If you open the bag and it takes you more than, I would say, three and a half minutes max to get that tent up, I don't want the tent. It's too special purpose. If it's really nice out and everything, it's a non-issue. But you know what? Manufacturers are smart people. They do all this market research. And the average person only goes out when it's nice. The minute it rains, they get back in their Volvos and drive home. So you know what? They only use their tent on average about a week a year anyway. So why design something for a small number of people that are in hardcore? The difference is, I think, is that most American tents are designed for people who are softcore. Most European tents are designed for people who are hardcore. And the difference in price can be huge. For example, uh, some of these uh, Norwegian, Swedish tents are over $1,000. Americans wouldn't think of paying a thousand, let alone five hundred dollars for a tent. So you got to bring out something for two or three hundred bucks, and you know it's only going to be used in a state park campsite uh, under under really nice weather for a few nights. So there's things that you have to, you know, there are things that you have to deal with if you have a two piece tent with a separate with a separate fly. And one of the things you have to do is when you take that tent down in the morning, if the fly is wet, you can't pack the fly with the tent. Because if you do, the tent's going to be all wet when you set it up. So you need another waterproof bag just to put the fly in. And then you put that inside the waterproof bag that the tent's in. So 
Didn't mean to do a dissertation on this, but this is just something to think about when you buy a tent. And by the way, I would add, it's not always the price you pay for one of these things that makes a better tent. I've seen some tents that are five, four or five hundred dollars, and I, I don't think they're very good at all. In fact, one of my favorite tents is a little interesting story if you have time. Is actually the North Face VE25. This is a geodesic dome. This baby will take 60 mile an hour winds. I've been in one at 62 miles an hour. I'm telling you, they're awesome. Now that's the good news. I want to tell you the bad news. Some friends and I recently completed a canoe trip down the upper Missouri River. The wind, we stopped at a campsite and the wind was probably, I'd say 40 miles an hour. 40, okay? 40 miles an hour. What? Can you not hear me? No sound? What's going on? Hello? No sound? What do I do? What do I do? Oh, shh. Um, hey, Cliff. Hey. This is Roxy. How Go you doing? I'm, I'm so, I'm the producer, you know who I am, but, uh, it looks like CW lost a little bit of internet. So he dropped out for a minute, which is okay. fine. You know, technology is so crazy these days. So, um, I want to keep you going with that question. So if you can elaborate on that for me a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So I want to say that when we did this, when we did this canoe trip, this is the upper Missouri river. Okay. And it, the wind was blowing about 40 miles an hour. Now the north we were sleeping in. My other buddies had an old Eureka Tundra Line tent, which was the remake of the old Cannondale Aroostook, which I was heavily praised in my flagship book, Penning Wild Rivers. We got the Aroostook right up. We could not get the VE up. Even with three of us working on it, we couldn't get it up. It was too windy. We literally just had a until that wind died down a bit. And then we got the whole crew, all four of us involved in this thing, and we managed to get it up. So this business of speed of pitching, ease of pitching, can be extremely important under difficult conditions. That's very cool. You know, uh, and by the way, I apologize. I don't know what happened. My... Uh my hey. system here has got a ghost in the machine, my Mac. I know we were both Mac users, and I'm telling you, I'm becoming less of a fan every day. There's some things that are going on with this thing, so I re very much apologize. Um, <clears throat> did you mention, and I'm just going to ask these real quick, did you mention uh, uh, bathtub floor? No, we didn't talk about that, but we can. Um, a bathtub floor, for those who aren't familiar with the term, simply means that the floor rolls up the sidewalls of the tent a bit and is sewn up here to the tent. So there's really only two pla uh, four places where water can, could get in. That would be at the four corners. Right? But in order to have a bathtub floor, you have to have a tent design that allows it. In other words, uh, a rectangular type tent that's this way Okay, so it can flow up. But if you have a dome tent, and right now it seems like every tent in America is a dome, okay? These things have five or six sides. When you're trying to take five or six sides and sew it to sidewalls, you can't have a bathtub floor because it's got to be sewn zip, 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 zip all the way around. Now, manufacturers claim that this is a non-issue because all tent scenes today are Seal, factory, mm -hmm. hot seal, okay? Hey, That's yep. good news. The bad news is the sealing often isn't perfect. And the more you use the tent, the more you get wear and tear and stretch on the tape and so forth and so on. And if you use the tent long enough and it rains hard enough, often enough, you can get leaks in there. In the old days, we used to seal seams by hand with a glue-like kind of Kind of, kind of stuff. Or we used to use Thompson's water here. Um, so the, then what they do is when they put the fly on, ideally the fly should go right to the ground. 
completely to the ground, should stake to the ground, but they don't do that. They run the fly up so it's about six inches above the ground, and then they stake it out. And their attitude is if it rains, it's not going to matter because the fly is set out a little bit. It's going to run off the fly and go down like so. Not necessarily. Until you if, get a wind. Yeah. I mean, if you've been there, done that, and you get a high wind, that high wind is going to lift up the corner of that fly. It can blow rain right underneath that fly. So a cop fly on a tent, I'm sorry, I'm not going to mince words. It's a stupid idea. <laughs> and it's done for one reason, to save wealth, to save material, to make a tent that's a little lighter, to say to the competition, my tent's lighter than your tent. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it's about, because you don't find cap flies on European tents. You, you'll never find a cap, you, you won't find a cap fly on a winter tent, right? Okay, on a summer tent where you want lots of ventilation and you've got netting in there, that's fine. Okay. Uh, one of the arguments is it's not a big deal. You can take the fly off and just have the uh, uh, and just have the uh, the netted tent out there. Yeah, sure you can. And then about two o'clock in the morning, it starts to rain and you'd wish you'd had the fly on. So yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it is what it is. It's I'm gonna jump. Question. I'm gonna jump. I'm going to jump through a couple of these real quick because I'm going to answer those questions. Um, I'm going to list a couple here. You just jump in with you uh, have anything to add to them. Um, first of all, sleeves for the poles instead of hooks. Uh, when I when I say sleeves, the, the pole goes through a sleeve instead of just hooks hooks on snaps on plastic hooks. Guy out loops got to have guy out loops. You can't storm rig a tent without guy out loops, and many of them yeah. don't have enough. I have sleeves. I have tents. Books. There's a reason why manufacturers quit using sleeves. The sleeves are fast. the The fly can be an integral part of the tent. Okay, you just run it through. Okay, uh, but every time you run a pole through a sleeve, there's some wear and tear on the sleeve. Eventually, you get a tear in the sleeve. Whereas if you put up a framework and you hook framework, you're not stressing the sleeves. So, you know, it depends, you know, they're both good systems if they're, you know, if they're done well. But longevity wise, the hooks are probably going to last longer than the sleeves. Or in order yeah. to get the sleeves to last longer, you're probably going to have to be uh, more reinforced material, a little heavier material, which is going to add to add to the weight of the tent. Yep. But still, my favorite tent of all time had sleeves, and that was the Canada Larissa. And all the years I've been camping and canoeing, I've never found a better tent than that. To yep. me, that's still the best tent in the world. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, would definitely agree with that. Uh, here's one more, real quick: is the uh, large vestibule. Got to have a place to take those boots off, man, if it's raining. Am I right? Yeah. A tent, a tent without a vestibule is, you don't want a tent without a vestibule. Not unless you're in Southern California where it doesn't rain. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's more than that. It's, yes, a vestibule provides a place for you to take your boots off and throw your wet stuff in. But it does something else, too, that uh, uh, that's pretty important. And that is it bulletproofs the ends of the tent. In other words, you got this end of the tent like this is staring out there at the weather. If you have a vestibule on it, that vestibule is going to close it off in an aerodynamic type thing, and the wind's going to blow around the tent yep. rather than, than blowing blow it. Through. Yep. So that's another plus about a vestibule. Uh, real quick here, um, and I think enough people have have heard this before that you talk about the ground cloth being inside the tent rather than outside. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but I want or spend any time. On, but I do want, we've had a question here. I want to do this for the United States and for the Europeans. Um, and you can, in Canada too, they've got a lot of Canada listeners here. Uh, what brands of tents would you recommend people look at? European, uh, American, and uh, Canadian before we go to the commercial break. You know, I hate I hate to go do brands. Um, yeah, give them a couple of good, good brands that you'd say these are solid brands. 
um, because there are actually a lot of really good down south. It depends what you do. If you are going in harm's way, I mean, you're going to do real serious stuff. You're going to be camping or canoeing above the tree line, for example, on the tundra, where you can easily have winds of 60 miles an hour. You need to give serious thought to the tent you're buying, okay? And then you're going to need a tent. And I'm going to say the prices on those are going to start at 500 and go up. The best, the best European, the best, you know, uh, you know just um, Google Norwegian and Swedish tents, and you're going to see some of these tents are over a thousand dollars, but they are solid. Uh, in the in the U.S. line, uh, there are tents that are designed for mountaineering. A lot of tents are designed for mountaineering. The problem is people think that because it's designed for mountaineering, that makes it great for everything else because they're going up on top of a mountain. Well, sure. guess what? You're not. You're camping in the desert, okay? <laughs> so that's not going to be a good good tent for you. Yep. Um, you know, my my flagship book, Canoeing Wild Rivers, has a little dissertation on tents. It's a huge, long chapter on tents, what to look for, what not to look for. But I would also say, if you, I will mention just one brand. If you are on a limited budget, and you want a good tent, and you don't want to spend a fortune, and you want it to be able to withstand winds of up to about 35 miles an hour, and where it can storm all day and keep you dry, and not spend a bundle for it, look at the Eurekas. They've been around for a long time. They're tents, they, they're excellent design. Now, that's the plus part on Eurekas. The mm -hmm. minus part is, these tents are designed to sell at a price. And in order to do that, they have to make some compromises, which is they generally aren't using the, the, the most high tech of fabrics. They go a step down, okay? The tents tend to be a little bit heavier than some of the competition. But for 250 bucks, you can get a tent that's gonna keep you as warm and dry and out of the weather as tents yep. that cost Two or three times that amount. Yeah, now, absolutely. that's not that's not my favorite tent design, but they are excellent. Okay. What's and a, um, what's a European tent? What's a European brand that you'd go, hey man, this is one of my favorite European because we did have that question specifically. Um, well, you know, right now, for some reason or other, I'm having a mind blank, and the name of my most favorite tent just escaped me. Can you remember the name of it? Uh, okay. I'm trying to remember. I don't know which one you're thinking of. <laughs> it's a tunnel. It's a tunnel. It's a tunnel it's a design. Tunnel, a tunnel tent. Oh, yeah. And you know what? You had yeah. those in your, your book. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. It just it slips Several. me. It's a, it's a tunnel design, to be honest with you. It's about an $800 tent. Yeah. And, it, and, and I really like it. Um, the, the other thing that's kind of an important thing to understand is we American manufacturers have done some things to pretty much keep European tents out of the American market. And what they've done is they have lobbied for a law that requires that all tents be flame proofed. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Europeans are not. Yeah. Think about it this way if a tent is made of one ounce per square yard nylon, Say, and you put a coating, say you put a two ounce coating on it. Now you're three ounces per square yard. Then you put a fireproof coating on it. I don't know how much that is. It's another ounce or so per square yard. Now mm -hmm. you're okay. So now you've kicked up the weight of the tent. Now, European manufacturers aren't bound by this. So they can use these ultra light silicone treated fabrics that are just super light and super strong. Those ultralight silicone fabrics are actually stronger than K-coated nylon, and they weigh a fraction of it. Problem is, you can't sell a tent that's made out of silicone here in, uh, well, in a store in the U.S., okay, because it doesn't meet fireproofing. That's the bad news. So you're stuck with American tents. But you can find these babies online. You can yeah. buy them. That's how I bought mine. But for some reason or other, I don't know why all of a sudden it's, 
you know, we, we, we old guys, we go through this every once in a while, this stuff flows out of our brain. And as soon as I hang up on this, I'm going to know, how could I not remember the name of my I mean, most favorite? I, I, I think it's, uh, is it Hilberg? Hilberg, that's it. It's a Hilberg. That's what I was thinking. Yep, yep. And the other uh, uh, Mustang seven seven four. He was the one in charge of memory because uh, there was Terra Nova too. But I was pretty sure those were Hilbergs. The one we were talking right, about. Right. Yeah, there's some other. There's some other um, Scandinavian tents which are which are also excellent. But yep. Hilbergs, Hilbergs are tough to beat. But if you yep. Google Hilberg and you look at their tents, you're going to roll your eyes at the price. Yeah. But <laughs> Here's what you get. Like I have a Hilberg Kadem. The Kadem is the lightweight version of the tent that, well, went to Everest or whatever. It weighs honest weight, pole stakes, the whole bit. It's like seven pounds, two ounces. Now this is a three-person tent. Read two people, okay? But it's lots of room for two people. It's got big, nice vestibule on each end. It goes up with three poles that go around. Setting it up is just Four stakes, one, two, three, well, one, two, three, four initially, and then one pole, two poles, three poles, it's up. Then you tune it with other stakes. You know, honestly, and we're going to go to commercial break, but I got to tell you something. I think those those uh, tents, those Hillsburg, Hillsburg tents are the best vestibules that I've ever seen. That's just me. I mean, they're they're nice and roomy and they're, you know, but just my opinion. Not that that means anything, but yeah. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, yeah, they're 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 great tents. I mean, if, if it was an American tent, it wouldn't weigh seven pounds. Yeah, it would right. weigh eight and a quarter or something. Right. All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about tarps. Uh, we're going to take a short break here. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more of the camping show on W4CY Radio and Talk Four TV right after these messages. time to go camping. Introducing Campground View's virtual tours. You can tour the campground, see the sites, see if they are available, and click to book your perfect spot. Hit the open road and explore the amazing places found in nature. We make it easy to discover, find, and book your site so that you can go have the fun and freedom you seek. Campground View's virtual tours make it easy and simple for you to see where you are going. And we're back with our guest, the camping show. Cliff, let's talk about tarpaulins or tarps for short. Um, Let's say we've got a properly designed tent. We're using a ground cloth inside the tent, and we've also rigged for a storm, okay? Uh, why then do we need a tarp? Okay? What do I need that for? Well, okay, you know, first, I think I need to tell a little story. Sure. Um, I don't know how many listeners out there are familiar with Bill Mason, who is a Canadian guru of canoeing. Uh, and Bill loved his 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 fireside tent, which was a big open, uh, sort of a lean to style tent. So a big baker tent. So it is. That's what he used all the time. And uh, Bill and I we conversed back and forth uh, many many times over the years. And uh, in his book, it's not Path of the Paddle. It's I think it's his latest book. I think was Song of the Paddle. Yeah, I think it was in the Song of the Paddle, and he's mm -hmm. doing recommended reading. And one of the ones he recommends is Canoeing Wild Rivers by me. And he said, this is almost a direct quote. He says, it's amazing how many times Cliff and I agreed on how we do things in the wilderness. However, <laughs> he's out to lunch on tents. I remember, okay? I remember. And here's why. Because Bill liked this big open front campfire tent. I like a smaller weatherproof tent with a big tarp that I can get under. So no matter how bad the weather is, this baby ain't going to blow down. The tarp could blow down, but the tent's going nowhere. Now, Bill, admittedly, yes, 
that tent of his can blow down in super high winds, okay? So basically what it boiled down to is Bill Mason liked uh, uh, a home tent, liked a home just the port. a house, okay? <laughs> I like two houses. Right, okay. right. But, but it's the, the point is it's the same either, you accomplish the same thing either way. The difference is for, to me, the tarp gives you some versatility. It gives you more versatility. Um, yes, with Bill's tent, you could build a fire out in front of it. But that tent of his was, I won't say it, it's not a nightmare to pitch, but it ain't fast either. And because it's got all these square surfaces, you really got to have lines on it or it's coming down and it's coming down on high winds. Because yeah. so my tent uh, goes up fast, it's dry, solid. And then I put the tarp up, I go under the tarp, I can cook whatever. And then if it rains really hard, that nylon tarp doesn't weigh much when it's wet. Whereas a great big slab sided canvas tent like that uh, is going to weigh a ton. So yeah. I guess you know, that's the answer to, you know, that's the, that's the answer to your question. When the weather gets bad, you need to have a place to cook, uh, lounge yeah. around, you know, uh, have a have a have a whiskey and not spill it all over the place. Whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I was going to tell you. Ironically, Becky still has that has her dad's tent, and uh -huh. she said we take it out at least once a year on a trip, just just for uh, nostalgia's yeah. sake or whatever. Yeah. Um. So it, it, let me throw something here just to back up. I mean, just to uh, agree with what you say. Uh, you're saying about the two separate things. I tell you what, when you're in bear country. You know, and I like to cook, uh, if I'm using a stove, I like to cook under my tarp. And I don't want to cook real close to where I'm sleeping if I'm in bear country. So this just adds more validity to the fact that I will get my tarp and I'll get it away from camp or from my uh, tent. And, you know, I don't have to worry about any food smells of any grease spatters or, you know, somebody's going to smell. That's just me. No, I, well, that's wise. You agree with that? Yeah. That, you know, that's wise. Because if you're... You know, in the old days, you know, they used to, if you read some of the old camping books, they used to say, this was the days of canvas tents, they would say. Um, when you leave camp, leave the tent flaps open so a bear can walk in around your tent, check the place out, and walk out. Okay, and that's because these canvas tents would collect all these odors from cooking right. fish and meat. It'd be in the canvas, you know. Um, yeah. We don't do that today. So a lot of the literature that you read of these old books are really geared to the way they did things 75, 100 years ago. You know, my canvas just smelled so much like canvas. I can't imagine anything uh, <laughs> overcoming. But it was just, you know what that smell is. You know, uh, uh, yeah, I, could I like that smell, but it's pretty damn strong. No, uh, let me throw this at you. Um, there are, there are, I'm going to hit two things on this. Uh, we're, we're, Kind of winding down on time. Um, some people use poly tarps. Um, I know you and I are both fans, and a lot of people are fans of the nylon tarp, and specifically the uh, silicone impregnated nylon tarps. What's the problem with what's the problem with uh, uh, tarps with grommets and and uh, uh, also irregular shaped tarps? What what uh, what's wrong with that whole idea? Well, first of all, let's do the the nylon versus polypropylene or all this other stuff. You're not going to see experienced people using poly tarps, okay? You use those to cover trucks. Right, right. But, you know, they're, ha they're, ju they're just heavy, and the problem with them is they start wearing them because they're, they're heavy and uh, they're not worth much money. People leave them in the woods. But, okay, you know, let's kind of go beyond that. You were talking about um uh, what size or shape shapes yeah you know there's a lot of special purpose shaped tarps you can get tarps with a strong cat and catenary cut in it which is a, a very very it's a curve it's an engineering curve that when you draw it tight from each end it's just as tight as it can be okay uh, the those are nice and they only require two stakes but the problem it's not a problem the issue is what seems wonderful in a state park camping ground isn't always wonderful in a remote wilderness place where there's barely room enough to set up a tent 
or there's no trees where you want them, or there's no trees anywhere. And now that changes everything. So if you get you get a special purpose tarp that is designed to set up, let's say, by attaching to this tree, to this tree, okay, this is a high catenary cut tarp, Stay, or excuse me, tree to tree, and then the sides, bang. Hey, you only got four points, how cool is that? It's great, but what if you don't have those two trees? Okay, now you gotta have a pole on each end, and you gotta have a couple of lines on each pole going there, okay? And then, because the sides go like this, okay, wind can get in there, so, you know, it, it, it depends what you're doing. If your camping is all pretty much in a certain place in a certain way, these specialty things are going to work for you. Yeah. But if you're going all different places, you might be on a, in the desert one night, you might be in northern ecosystem another time, or whatever. Frankly, I think you're better off, the closer you get to a rectangular tarp, the better off you're going to be just because it's versatile. You can set it up in a whole number of different ways. Yes, it's going to be a little bit slower to set up than one of these catenary tarps with just bang, bang, and it's up. But that's the price you pay for yep. versatility. And it's I also think I also think square square tarps are in that category with the, uh, uh, the, the rectangular ones. In some cases, they might even be a little more versatile. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, well, if I had a choice... I would like a completely square tarp rather than a rectangular one. Right. Yeah. Uh, why? Because almost always when you set up a rectangular tarp, you set it up with the long ways this way and mm -hmm. the short way going out front. But the problem is you got to figure out which end that is. Now, if it's <laughs> color coded, then okay, you know immediately. But still, if it were square, it wouldn't be an issue. So the question is, well, why don't they make square tarps? It's really simple because when you buy the material, it comes in a bolt that's so wide, okay, and then you cut it off so long, okay, and so you can, you can make it longer now, but you can't make it any wider unless, of course, you want to sew more fabric on it. So that's why you see rectangular tops and you very seldom see square ones. I think we should mention um, our friend Dan Cook. Thanks, cool, whoever posted something. I appreciate yeah, that, that. I think that's Johnny, right? Yeah. Yeah. There he goes. I could sit there for days and listen to Cliff talk. I'd be a sponge soaking up this mouthful of information. Hey, for sure. Um, and, I, and I'm very fortunate and blessed to have uh, a legend on my show like you, Cliff. Um, but I think we should mention our uh, good friend Dan Cook over at Cook Custom Sewing. Um, he makes square tarps. He makes rectangular tarps. He makes square tarps. Uh, he makes uh, one of the best tarps I've ever seen, personally. How about you? I would... I would go further. I wouldn't say he right. makes one of the best tops. I, mean, I, I would say he makes the best tops. Yes, and, and that's really what I meant to say, yeah. Um, and I'll tell you. You will, have, things, you will not have a CCS tarp come apart. Yeah, and, and there's lots of storm loops on that tar on those tarps. Uh, lot, lots and lots of versatility those uh, those tarps offer. Wouldn't you agree? You know, it's kind of interesting. You asked me earlier about grommets and a little story to tell I've got the phone <laughs> on it. Maybe two minutes. Many, many years ago, when I was young and didn't have gray hair, I bought a tarp from Eddie Bauer. Okay? Oh, and wow. it was an orange tarp and had grommets all the way around. And as soon as I bought it, I went to the salesperson there and I said, this tarp isn't going to make it. And I'm telling you, these grommets are going to pull out. And he says to me, he said, sir, <laughs> this is any power tarp. This is sure. guaranteed for life. If anything goes wrong with this, you bring it back and we'll give you a new one. I said, okay. Two years later, I brought it back. He gave me a new one. Okay. And then about a year later, it ripped the grommet out. And I said, enough of this. No more grommets. And that's when I started sewing loops on these things and reinforcing them. And, of course, that's all. That's the way CCS tops are all built. There's no grommets. It's all reinforced looping, which is the way it should be. So what happens is people tend to look at these tops, which can be hundreds of dollars, say, I'm not going to buy a tarp like that. I can buy one at Walmart for $29. Sure you can. And you can take it out in pieces when it shreds in the first storm. No, it's yeah, you know, and and you did a video. I did a video also on this. 
rigging or uh, outfitting your rain tarp. And basically what that means is just attaching paracord on the end so that it's much easier to work with than going into a little loop and string it through every time. But, uh, uh, but anyway, that's a different thing. Um, I, we're going to jump to that here. Uh, we got about four minutes left. Um, you can also, and you, and actually this I learned from you is rigging twin tarps to make more rain. Instead of having to buy another or a, a great big tarp and you got a small, two small tarps and you can, and there's a way to rig them. And you're a genius, by the way, <laughs> of course. Yeah, that's, that's interesting you said it because yeah. uh, I, I described that in my book, Camping Stop Secrets. Uh, but it's kind of an engineering nightmare to try to follow unless you're an engineer. And that was actually the impetus for me to do the video, the Forgotten Skills video, because once you see it actually being done in film, oh, this is really easy. But the beauty of the twin tarp feature is you can make a fire right under the front tarp and it exhausts the smoke like an Indian teepee through, uh, you know, through, the, flaps, through the flaps at the top. It's a little time consuming to put up, but it's really cool. If you put a, and you can dry stuff underneath, the heat stays in, it's pretty cool. So you sometimes know, you may be better off with two small tarps than with one giant one for that reason. 100%. And I've done that a number of times since I saw, and that was where I learned that is the video, your video, Forgotten Skills. And I can tell you, that works out. The only time that doesn't work is if you get a wind in there whipping around. But otherwise, yeah. if it's a straight rain and, you know, whatever. You can a little small fire, not a bonfire, but a small fire, and you pull that flap down on from the inside, and that'll suck that smoke right out of there. That's it really cool. doesn't take that long to set up. I mean, honestly, it's not that big a deal. Uh, but it is yeah. wonderful, and you don't have to buy a second huge tarp when you got a group of ten. You can yeah. put these. And there two. are times there. There have been times on some of our far northern trips where you have a tight spot, you can't get a great big tarp up. You can get right. one small one up, and then you can get an, another little one off a corner of it or something like that so mm -hmm. that's the beauty of rectangular tarps you can move them around and whereas a one giant tarp sometimes you're just stuck you, 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 there are places where it's very difficult to get out yeah absolutely and then we okay so um real quick here um i'm just gonna read this off if you please add something to it uh, we got about two minutes left um for for rigging a, uh, a rain tarp as well as storm proofing your tent uh we need these things uh of course stakes um and paracord some people really don't I mean, using twine and things paracord is the best material to use and by the way <clears throat> you get a color like fluorescent orange fluorescent green when you get up in the middle of the night to pee you won't fall. You're likely not to fall over the the brightly colored stuff like you would a piece of twine or 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 whatever you know different colored uh, uh, paracord. Um, and of course, I, I always carry a pole. I know you carry a couple poles. I usually carry at least one. I've carried three before. If you're out, you know, canoeing a canoe trip. One thing that we didn't talk about uh, was a real quickly here, and we got like about a minute or two left. Um, the lean to tarp, which is generally what I use. I'm sure that's probably generally what you use. And for that, you need rope. What kind of rope do you bring with you, Cliff? Well, you know what? I pretty much, much. I, I, you know, if you're a canoeist, you're going to have a, a quarter inch or three sixteenths or three eighths inch rope with you all the time anyway. And it's a done deal. If you're a backpacker, you're not going to carry anything that heavy. You're going to do the whole thing with paracord. But you mm -hmm. did mention the wheel and lean to, and I have one. Dan Cook makes one. It's called the lean. They've been around for decades and decades and decades. They're a nice unit, but in a sense, and they are they're delightful because they're completely enclosed. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, they're they're not as easy to get up as a rect rectangular tarp. You don't get the airflow that you get with a rectangular tarp. They're bulkier. And the sides are uh, the sides are closed off, so you can't see out the sides. So as uh, so all I'm saying is, these are all good, wonderful things, but everything is a trade off, and you it's have to decide what you need. But before we leave, because you mentioned stakes, stakes are really important, and they shouldn't all be the same kind. They should be many different kinds. They should be kinds for soft grounds, grounds uh, for hard ground, big long, big long twelve inch aluminum. Arrow shaft stakes, yep. 
These are expensive steaks. You're not going to buy these babies for 50 cents a piece. Cook Custom Selling has what you need. And real quickly, and then we're going to sign off here uh, because I'm behind schedule. Um, bring extra paracord for storm rigging. And what are the lengths that you yeah. wrap your paracord in? How long do you? What I do, with, what I do with my paracord, everything is cut into approximate 15-foot lengths. So I've got some 10-footers in there. I'll take 250 uh, feet of parachute cord, cut it into 10 or 15 foot lengths, wind it all up. If you need more length, you just tie tie the two of them together with a quick release sheet bed. You just mm -hmm. daisy chain them. But you don't want to be cutting cords when a storm's coming up. So yeah, I have a no. little net bag just filled with cords. Yeah. And you yeah. always bring extra. I remember that's, that's an important point. Cliff, uh, I'll tell you what, it... Uh, we're at the end here. We've got uh, Cliff's, uh, it's cliffcanoe.com uh, cliff is your website. And I just want to say, Cliff, it uh, as always, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, and, you know, thank you for being here and, and sharing the, your your uh, infinite well, wisdom. Yes. Thanks, C.W. And I would encourage those who are interested in this stuff. I do a blog every month on my website, cliffcanoe.com. It's free, costs you nothing. You can sign up for them. And the latest one that's up there, put up just the other day, is called Toughest Loop in the Boundary Waters. Well, Cliff, be sure to, for everybody, be sure to tune in here next week because Cliff is going to be back with the second of our three part series, Outdoor Gear Edge Tools. And uh, again, we're looking forward to seeing you again next week. And once again, thank you for tuning into the camping show. This is CW Gets reminding you. Learn more, do more. See you next week. Thank you all.